So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball capital world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Joey and Larry Gallo were some pretty bad hombres. So bad, even most of the mafia wanted nothing to do with them in New York in the 1960s and 1970s. Murder, extortion, armed robbery, all in a day's work for these guys. But if they were so bad, why do so many literary types come to admire them, especially Joey? Bob Dylan, for example, early in his career thought of crazy Joey Gallo as more folk hero than outlaw. And I've now read Tom Folsom's rich, colorful history of the Gallo brothers, the mad ones, but I'll be honest, I still don't entirely get their appeal. Hopefully, the author can clear up the mystery. Tom Folsom, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, welcome to the show. Um, so I'm through the book, and uh, you know, fascinating stuff. But I, I, I I'm just, I don't, I don't get it. Why, why, why was some of the literati of the time so drawn to the gallows? What, what is it about them? Well, you know, Joey Gallo is certainly not your typical gangster. I mean, most gangsters aren't able to quote Camus and Sartre and speak on existential philosophy as well as they can talk about you know, shaking down an extortion victim. Uh, <laughs> yeah. to, 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 uh, so to me, you, know, you have to realize that you know when Joey's coming out of prison, this is probably around 1972, uh, he's coming right at the cusp of The Godfather, which is it's a phenomenon in New York and all across the country. And, you know, I think a lot of these kind of high society types are, are uh, you know, they just watch this fantastic movie, The Godfather, and you see these, the, the, the three Corleone boys, you know, Michael and Sonny and Fredo, and, you know, they don't seem like such bad guys. And, you know, I think that The, the Godfather kind of paints a, an inaccurate portrait of, of what the mob is, uh, very much romanticizes it, and so... You know, I think people are watching this movie and they're saying, "Well, you know, the mafia isn't so bad. They're just they're just on the outs of society, and they've been shut up by America." And I think, uh, given the fervor of this, I think everybody who was anybody, as, as one person said, wanted to meet a real life mobster. And so here comes Joey Gallo onto the scene, and uh, he's he's friends with Jerry Orbach, and, and Jerry, of course, played Joey Gallo in uh, in the gang that couldn't shoot straight, in, in a character named Kid Sally Palumbo. Uh, so you got a guy like Jerry Orbach making the introduction to the high society, and, and they look at Joey and they see this, you know, charismatic, you know, gangster, and they think everything is just charming and wonderful until, you know, a couple weeks later when he gets whacked outside of Umberto's clan house in Little Italy. Now, did the same thing happen with The Sopranos? Did did that did that show on HBO make it uh, make it uh, uh, acceptable to uh, say, hey, the mobsters, they're not so bad, so what if they kill people and you know extort money and do all those other kind of things? They're kind of cool. They're on TV. Well, I think at this point we're a little more media savvy perhaps than you know, when at the time, when, when, at least media savvy in terms of you know, thinking about organized crime uh, than it was in the 1970s. I mean, I think that uh, for so much of the 50s, you know, the, the mob was really shrouded in mystery, and you, you have these Senate hearings about him, and, and uh, you know, people really didn't know that much about, about the mob. And so when The Godfather comes out, I mean, this is stuff, you know, that people would have been killed for knowing 10 years earlier, I'd say. But, you know, he kind of, uh, you know, Mario Puzo, you know, half invented and half drew from some of the experiences that actually were from the Gallo brothers, one of which was going to the mattresses and sleeps with fishes. I mean, these, these are stories that came straight from the Gallo brothers' story. Uh, so, so given that, I, I think that, uh, you know, again, this is very much, you know, Puzo's portrayal of this new and fascinating world, and again, it's, a, it's, it's this phenomenon, and, and, and people were really swept up by it, and I think, and Joey definitely coasted that, uh, that, that, that sort of mobster frenzy, uh, I think one, one sort of like called a gangster chic. Mm-hmm. Now, did, did Joey want these, uh, celebrity and society friends, or did, did he just, you know... Well, I mean, he definitely did. Get, you know, I think yeah. that, you know, most smart mobsters are the ones that want to stay in the rackets for, you know, for a good amount of time. They stay behind the scenes. Once you really start exposing yourself to, to, to the media, uh, become a character like, like a John Gotti, for instance, well, then you're just going to be on the top of the, of the Fed list to take down. Uh, so, you know, Joey, you know, this happened again in the, 60, in the early 60s. He was all over the, you know, he would hold impromptu press conferences. 
know, he even invited you know, Life Magazine to come in, into Gallo headquarters on President Street on the waterfront in Brooklyn and take photographs of the Gallo gang. This is unheard of when you're talking about uh, you know, a mafia with, with codes of omerta and, and shrouded in secrecy. Now, I, I get that he was uh, media savvy and that he read a, a, a good deal, but you know, I, I, I can't say that he's, he comes off as terribly bright in the book. I mean, reading the books, you know, reading Camus and Sartre, and I mean, it, it, the idea, I think, in most people's mind is that it, it's enlightening and it opens your mind to things, but mm-hmm. it, it doesn't seem to have worked that way for Joey, except in that as word gets around that, that he's read these books and, you know, you have him in, in his notebooks writing things down that he sees in these books, it doesn't really seem to have affected him the same way. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, it's a, a guy like Joey. He's going to take what he learns, uh, you know, from both the coffee shops of Greenwich Village, where he liked to hang out in the early '60s, and you know, when he's in prison during the uh, during, during the 1960s, during the, you know the rise of of black nationalism. Uh, you know, the prison's a real hotbed for this, the prison system. And so, Joey's taking what he he's learning and he's twisting it to his own means. And what Joey would do is he would, you know, he decided that, well, I'm going to start creating alliances with, with guys like Nicky Barnes, who was the, uh, the person I wrote my last book with, Mr. Untouchable, uh, mm-hmm. who was an infamous Harlem heroin dealer, uh, portrayed an American gangster uh, by Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, you know, these aren't necessarily socially acceptable ideas, you know, making, making alliances, you know, to, to rule the heroin trade of New York City. Uh, but for the mafia, these were, uh, these were, these were actually quite revolutionary uh, ideas that that Joey is bringing forth. But if now if Joey is is smart enough to seek out these alliances uh, with a uh, Nicky Barnes uh, after the commission said uh, no 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 we're not doing drugs you know and then they push that out to the to the margin so to speak and and you know they start uh, gallows or whomever is dealing dealing drugs through uh, surrogates like a Nicky Barnes maybe or others but. If, he's, if, if, if Joey is smart enough to cultivate the press, to cultivate uh, uh, black militants or uh, just people outside the basic uh, Italian family, um, why wasn't he smart enough to uh, improve his position uh, within organized crime and find a better place for himself? I mean, it, it seems like you know, from, from the day we're introduced to him, he's at odds with the very people he should be you know, we would call it now networking with. No, well, very much. I mean, well, this is, uh, you know, this is, to me, the mafia in the 50s was, was uh, you could think of it as a corporation to, to rival IBM. I mean, even Robert Kennedy had said, uh, you know, organized crime is the greatest threat on American soil. Uh, the mob was serious business in the 50s. Uh, so I feel that, you know, Joey's looking at this, and, and basically, for a guy to move up the ranks, he's got to, you know, he's got to start in the mailroom, then he's got to make his way up the up the up the corporate ladder of of the mafia, up, up the ladder of Murder Inc. Almost, as, as you can put it in, in corporate terms. Uh, so Joey didn't have the patience for that. You know, I think that a lot of people in the uh, when you're thinking about the late '50s, early '60s, especially in a place like Greenwich Village, you know, they don't want to be. They, they don't want to follow the traditional rules of the establishment. They want to forge their own paths and and blaze their own trails. And, I, I, you know, ultimately it didn't work. You know, this, this, and I think this could, could have been, you know, one of the, the lessons learned of the 60s. But, you know, Joey, uh, he was caught up in that spirit. And, uh, you know, 10 years later he ended up getting you know, gunned down in the clam house. Right back where he started, basically. Yeah. Uh, what was, I mean, Joey's nickname was Crazy Joey Gallo. Was, was he crazy? Well, I, it's tough to say. I, you know, the uh, police, well, when they were, you know, we, we, his psychiatric files say that he was a, a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, and, you know, I think our understanding of, of mental illness has definitely progressed since, since then. Uh, I think he definitely played the crazy card to his advantage uh, in terms of, you know, he, he, his favorite character in the movies, you know, Joey's a big fan of B-movies, and he, like one in particular, a guy named Richard Widmark, who played Tommy Udo. Uh, Tommy Udo was, was this psychopathic, wise-cracking killer in, in Kiss of Death, and, you know, he really terrified the audiences by doing things like pushing an old lady in a wheelchair down the steps. You know, and now we can almost think of it as almost a guy like the Joker in, in, in Batman. 
but Joey looks at a guy like that, and he's you know this is he's using terror and and the ability to to inflict fear in people uh, by being a psychotic. This is kind of his. This is a, this is a persona that he cultivates, and hence he he wanted people to know the name Crazy Joe, and he would actually recall reporters when they didn't uh, you know, print his nickname in the papers. It's uh, it is a it is a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And what about what about Larry? Tell, I mean, Joey gets all the ink. Uh, uh, what's the difference between Larry and Joey is in terms of the way they operated? And... Well, I think you know, Larry Joey was the, the spark plug of the Gallo gang, but Larry was the boss. They actually, his nickname was Larry the Boss. And uh, apparently, you know, he was a very kind of quiet figure. He would do things like he would. You know, in the middle when the Gallo brothers were going to the mattresses, meaning that they would all hold up Alamo style in, the, in this tenement and, and with a bunch of shotguns and, and, and you know, hide out from the enemy. Uh, he would do things like he would pick up his violin and he would play Verdi. Uh, Verdi was a very en- enigmatic character, but uh, he was apparently uh, really the brains of the Gallo family you know, business. And as one detective who knew him uh, put it to me, he said, well, Larry Gallo is a genius. He could take your watch apart. So, you know, Larry was the guy who, uh, he could always control Joey, though. That was, that was one thing about, you know, Joe, Larry was the older brother, and as the older brother, you know, he was uh, responsible, as I'd say, for the, for the Gallo family mantle. Hmm. Well, I want to uh, give uh, our listeners a chance to call in. We've got a new, <laughs> we've got a new uh, web chat system, and uh, I, didn't, I, I hadn't looked at it in a moment, and I see there's a whole bunch of people who uh, would like to uh, call in. So if you want to give us a call... Six four six five nine five three one three five. You can call, talk to Tom Folsom about his new book, uh, The Mad Ones, and I'll caution you to do it uh, only if you're listening to us live, which is uh, Friday, May twenty second, um, two thousand nine. If you're listening to us on tape, you can call, but we won't answer. Um, now, there's a third brother involved. Now, um, I forgot to say the kid his, blast. His, kid blast. He never rose even as high as uh, Larry and Joe did. No, he was the he's the kind of the quintessential little, little brother, I, I'd say, of the Gallo gang. Uh, they they didn't uh, misunderstood, uh, underappreciated, or just uh, you know. Not, well, I not think a... he he was the one where you know once uh, once Joey got gunned down, you know, Kid Blast was kind of responsible for for the future of the Gallo gang and, and to see where he'd take him. I mean, I think the papers you know put that a guy like Kid Blast was. Uh, you know, some people thought he was, you know, he, he had the the best of both brothers, you, you might say, you know, kind of the uh, uh, Larry's brains and I think Joey's uh, kind of charisma, uh, if you talk about it in, in, in those terms. Uh, but, you know, he was kind of in charge of the Gallo gang until this entire Gallo war, I'd say, kind of slowly petered out over the, over the course of the 70s. And, you know, by that time they kept fighting so much. I think the five families were, you know, willing to give the gals whatever they wanted because they were they'd been so sick of, uh, you know, having to fight these these troublesome gala boys for the you know boys for the past uh, two decades. Interesting. Well, let's uh, let's go to the phones. Uh, hi, do you have a, a comment or question for Tom Folsom? Uh, yes, Tom. Uh, I want to tell you I didn't get to read your book yet. Uh, how how new is the book? Uh, it's uh, about two weeks old. Oh, okay, great. I'm I'm definitely going to get it. Uh, do our uh, borders carry it? Sure, absolutely. Great. I can't. I mean, I I love books like that. You know, when I was in a joint, uh, the only books I read was like I read Gotti's thing, and you know, I just read all kind of mob books all the time. I, I've always been infatuated with it, uh, only because my line of work dealt with it a little bit, and uh, I I touched the edge of it in the business I was in. I was in a vending business, and you kind of can't help touching. The outer skirts of that, you know. Well, sure. No, the the, uh, the gals actually uh, they own the direct vending machine company. Vending sure. machines were uh, that was their bread and butter. Sure, I was in a poker machine business and pull tables, shoot boxes, and stuff like that. I did it for thirty years, and uh, um, uh, but I want to talk about you. Um, we're not here to talk about me. Uh, one of my questions is um, what the Gallo Gang. How old is the is this information that you that you've uh, got from this? How old is the information in this book? Well, uh, you know, a lot of the information was uh, recently released. You know, I, I got them released before, uh, about 15,000 
pages or fifteen hundred pages rather of FBI files and the Gallo right. brothers. So, so you got you got three oh twos and you got stuff like uh, uh, crime crime commission reports and different yeah, things absolutely. like that. Absolutely, and uh, yeah. it was interesting when you're looking at these files. I mean, you know, the the FBI, uh, you know, they would watch the gallows about twenty four seven over a course of you know, I'd say about two years in the, in the early 60s. And the Gallo brothers were, you know, they were the low men on the, on the mafia totem pole. And, you know, but the FBI, they established a relationship. I'm not saying the Gallo were, were squealing or anything, uh, but they, you know, kind of hung around enough and they'd hear talk. But, you know, I think the FBI got a more complete picture of what the Cosa Nostra bat was about just by spending day in and day out with the Gallo brothers and learning information from, from the bottom up. Uh, than I think that they had from any other source until that time. Right. Well, the Gallo brothers were—they were a little bit. They flaunted it like like Gotti flaunted it. Absolutely. And, and for and for some reason, um, you know, the Italian mafia. Um, and, and I know you got different type. Well, I'm just using the word mafia as family. Okay. Um, I'm not really stereotyping any particular uh, nationality. But you know, you have the Irish Westies. You know, you have uh, different groups like that, and the Italian. Uh, Mobsters, for some reason, what I got out of it, they're always the ones that would squirrel on everybody. They'd squirrel on their own parents if they got in trouble. And I was just kind of wondering why. Why did that characteristic always hit them when they were supposed to be such tough guys? Uh, I'm not sure if I, you know, I, I could, could answer you know, that question, uh, honestly. Well, I mean, I, I don't mean it in, in, in a derogatory way. I, I'm just asking you is, you know, it didn't involve any Irish people or anything. It was, it was mostly Italian. Your, your, the book you write is mostly Italians, right? And their mm -hmm. lifestyles and everything. Am I correct? Yes, correct. Uh, okay, so it didn't get in, your book didn't get into any other type of mob. Did they have any mob relations with any other uh, organizations like like the Irish Mafia or Polish Mafia or whatever? No, uh, you know, but the Gallows did. Uh, you know, they, you could call them many things, but one thing is that they weren't uh, they weren't necessarily prejudiced. I mean, they would have. Uh, they were kind of known as the international gang, uh, the outlaw gang among, uh, you know, uh, among members of the five families. Uh, you know, they had guys like they had an, an Egyptian uh, hitman named Ali Baba, uh, who was a, you know, and they'd have you know, uh, some Syrian tough guys. Uh, I think Louis, Louis the Syrian was one of them. Uh, so they kind of cultivated a lot. Uh, you know, it wasn't just exclusively uh, Italian or Sicilian. Uh, and, and this was a uh, this kind of got the gals a reputation as uh, as outlaws. Right. Did uh, your your book goes back as far as the 1960s with them? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it begins around 1957 uh, through Joey's death in '72. Did it have anything in there about like the Kennedy assassination and the mob and that? Well, you know, Did you it, touch any there? Oh, I, I, I one one report that I had was was, was quite interesting. It was. Uh, they were basically saying that, well, the there's no way that the mafia could have been uh, involved in the Kennedy assassination because the Gallo brothers had thrown the five families into such upheaval with their revolt uh, that there were, the mafia was too busy dealing with the Gallos to even deal with the Kennedys. Now, were the Gallos at the Appalachian meeting? No. Okay, they weren't there, so they kind of preceded that or postseded that. I mean, yes, it was, they came after. Okay, and do, the, do you interact with John Gotti, the Gambino family at all? Uh, no, no, that's no. uh, it's, separate that's family. Huh? Two separate family. Then they came. They were ones before uh, the Gambinos. Then, right? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, listen. I appreciate the answers there, and uh, good luck with your thing. And I, I do I smell a movie here uh, soon or? Yes. The uh, the film rights have been uh, bought by the Weinstein Company, so wow, we're, we're looking forward to that. Great. Fantastic. Well, that, my kind of movies guy. You know, there's no Sopranos on, so you got to fill that that want that, that need you got inside for that mobster stuff. You know, <laughs> as, as all the wannabes. You know, you got to get that taste of it. You know, so uh, good luck with everything, and I, I'm looking forward to reading the book, and I'll get it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks sure, for your Mr. call. Sure, Mr. Media. Sure, Mr. Media. Uh, there, uh... Tom, are there? I mean, this guy is talking about being on the the, the fringes of all that kind of stuff in the vending machine business. Uh, are you finding a, a lot of people uh, want to talk to you in the same in the same manner because you know they've been close to it or they have a fascination with it? Or? Well, I try to been keeping a, a professional distance, let's say. <laughs> well, I, I mean, one of the things I wondered about is is the research. You you talk uh, at the beginning of the book about. Uh, uh, the sources of the book. Did did you? But I, I 
I'm not sure if I missed this, but did you actually interview any uh, any mobsters, anyone you know with uh, those connections, or did you rely primarily on uh, uh, FBI files and uh, transcripts of uh, wiretaps and well, previous well, for one I spoke with Nicky Barnes, who was uh, I mean he he plays a key okay. role in the story, and and he was he and Joey you know forged this friendship uh, in '60s prisons. Uh, I also talked to you know like I, I think I mentioned earlier, you know. The, the FBI guys and, and the detectives who were following the Gallo brothers, you know, they were basically living there on President Street where the, where the Gallows were, were holed up and going to the mattresses, you know, for, again, in the, in the early 60s and the late 70s. And, you know, they would, they had relationships with them. They, they you know, they would even sit down and, and have dinner with the guys, you know. So this is, uh, it was just, it, you know, part of the nature is that you, you got a really good sense of the atmosphere and the flavor of what these guys were about, just talking to uh, the NYP detectives and FBI men who were just going in there day in and day out as a part of their job. Well, reading reading the book as the, when the FBI comes in and settles down settles in on uh, President Street to try to prevent uh, the uh, bloodshed, uh, you you kind of suspect that it's leading to the point where um, the FBI becomes. I don't want to say enamored, but they, they see they no they no longer see these guys as uh, aliens. They see them as people. They see them interact with their kids. They True, but at the same them. time, they don't. Uh, you know, they've got a job to do, and you know, the guys in the FBI. You know, sometimes when you're you know, kind of the friendly you are, the more that you know, they may kind of slip up on the other end and tell you something or give you a little tidbit here, and you report that that goes straight to J. Edgar Hoover. You know, and and through forging these relationships. You know, they were able to get a, a wealth of information that would not have been available to them otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a uh, plot line in the uh, Sopranos near the end where the uh, the FBI agent who's, who's who's following them and always got his eye on them is always parked outside of the the uh, the butcher shop. Eventually, comes and talks to them and, and tips uh, Tony and his crew off that. Uh, Someone's out to get him, and you know he becomes more protective of of Tony than coming after Tony. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you do you ever get a sense from you know talking to these detectives that they they actually built some? Uh, no, some I, I, they, 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 were, they always had their eye on the job. Okay. You know, yeah, you can certainly be friendly with the with these guys. You can certainly you know milk them for for information, uh, but at the end of the day, you know they were they were very clear about the job that they had to do. Now, uh, in you you have some incredible detail. I want to ask you about this. I know you say up front that n- none of this has been recreated. That it's uh, so. Uh, tell me about this. I mean, you describe on on page eighty three, for example. Uh, uh, this is where Larry gets uh, nearly strangled. Pretty close to. I mean, you know, you get to the end of the section, you think he has been. You say. Uh, Hands emerged from the dark glass out of nowhere. Larry saw the reflection of a manila cord as it looped around his neck and pulled tight. He scratched at it, but his fingertips slid off. The rope twisted tighter, expertly pulled at the knotted ends. The gara I never know if I'm saying that right, ripped back and forth across Larry's neck, sawing into his flesh, slow and methodical. Larry fell off the stool onto the floor. Always neat as a pin, he hated that everything spilled from his bowels. His heart stopped. How do you get that kind of detail? I mean, there was only two people there, and one of them, you know, was probably never found. Well, they've got, uh, you know, they've, they've, there was a, a large inquiry into that, that event. I mean, this, they, they were ultimately never able to uh, convict uh, anybody in that strangling, uh, strangling, strangling of Larry because Larry would, he refused to identify his own killers, or, or would-be killers, rather. This was part of the Mafia Code. Uh, but there were, there, were count, there, were, there were months and months of uh, police investigations into this, and the uh, the fruits of those investigations were made public. But I mean, this kind of detail—the only person who could provide that kind of detail would be would be Larry. Well, they also got the bartender there, you know, the, 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 and and uh, you know, who knows what went behind closed doors in terms of you know what went behind the NYPD, what they would go on the record about, what they wouldn't. You know, I'm looking at what you know the F, the, the NYPD came up with. In the course of this case, and you can uh, you can take their details of when where they got it from, uh, you, you know who knows who knows what kind of deals they made. But you know ultimately, no one would uh, would would stand before a jury and uh, 
and, and make these kind of accusations, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't uh, information there. All right. What about this one, uh, page uh, 61? Uh, I mean, and this is fascinating reading, but I, I mean, to be honest, and I mean no disrespect whatsoever, Tom, it, it's, uh, it reads more like fiction than nonfiction. I mean, you have a conversation here with uh, Joey and uh, Jeffy, who's, I'm not sure if, if they were married at that point, if that came later, but they're, uh, uh, I think they're in the car. Uh, you say sweat bubbled up on Joey's brow. They're driving, blah, 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 blah. And then if, if anything happens to me, said Joey, I want you to go with my mother, with the kid. I'm not having a kid for your mother, said Jeffy. If you want your mother to raise a kid, go fuck your mother. How do you get, I mean, dialogue like that? With, Jeffy. You know? Jeffy this, is, you, this is from Jeffy. She, did you talk to her or did, was she? She passed uh, away before the, the project began, but she'd given interviews about this uh, and other sources. Wow. Okay. I, I mean, I have to ask. It's uh, like I said. It it, it reads like uh, like great fiction, and it's it's very colorful. But it's so detailed, and there's only Larry, uh, sorry, Joey and Jeffy in the car. So, well, yeah, I mean, if you take a look, uh, take a look at the back of the bibliography, it's, you 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 call the these fact. details from countless sources, and right. you know one thing that the gals weren't was press shy. Uh, they were featured in the Saturday Evening Post. They were featured in a, in a Spread in Life magazine. You know. For instance, uh, as as well as daily FBI files that are coming in, you know, from from uh, the FBI to straight to, straight to Hoover. Right, but in the in the '60s and early '70s, uh, no one was printing lines like, you know, if, if you want a baby for your, you know, you go fuck your mother. So, I mean, well, of that's, course, that's, but this is you know, these are, these things are after the fact. Okay. And people reminisce. All right, and um, did your research give you any pause to think of the gallows as uh, misunderstood? I think that the uh, I, I think the gals probably presented themselves exactly as, as they you know wanted to be be portrayed. Uh, you know I think that this idea that they became cultural icons says as much about America's fascination with gangsters and mythologizing of gangsters uh, as it does about the gals themselves. The fact that you have someone saying you know like a cultural luminary like Susan Sontag saying you know, I wish I, I met Joe Gal before you know, he died. You know that's uh, that to me is is reason enough, let alone the reason that a guy like Bob Dylan writes a song about a guy like Joey Gallo. You know why is this happening to me? That that's that's a that's a fascinating uh, uh, place to look. Yeah, I mean stuff like that just makes me think that uh, you know even uh, uh, the literati are flawed. Uh, although you know it's interesting that he that Dylan, the same guy who writes writes a song about Gallo, wrote you know and took up the defense of Reuben Carter, which a completely different situation, a guy who was falsely accused, and I don't want to sing the song or anything, but uh, I just, I, I will never understand why Susan Sontag, uh, you know, felt that something was missing because she didn't meet Joey Gallo before he died. I mean, these are, these are, these are not nice people. These are people who, you know, who've done all kinds of horrible things, and they get romanticized, and, uh, you know, I just, I, I'll never understand that part, that part of it. Um, I, you know, it's just, Strange. And I wanted to ask you. I asked you before if Joey was crazy. Was if, if he was or wasn't? Was he? If he was, was he any crazier than anyone else in his line of work? I mean, well, I think he was more out, you know, flamboyantly crazy. I mean, that was his, that was his mo in terms of well, I'm going to use uh, this kind of wise, cracking, giggling personality to to shake the fear, shake, shake down the you know, put the fear into my victims. I think that's. Uh, you know th- that was that was definitely a, a, a Joey Gallo trademark, but you know uh, a lot of these guys are sociopaths and, and psychopaths in their own way. There's there's no denying that. How did uh, uh, Nicky Barnes, um, you know, how did he feel about Gallo? I mean, it's, many years have passed, and is he does he have did he have a is he just very straightforward about what Gallo is and was or? But, you know, does he speak with fondness of the man? Oh yes, he definitely speaks with fondness about him, and these guys were. You know, like I said, they were friends of the joint for for years, and I think that they, uh, you know, they kind of both fancied themselves, you know, philosophers slash gangsters, and you know, in in the '60s prisons. So you know, they're they're all up on existential philosophy and everything that's in the vogue in the '60s prisons at the times. Uh, and in many ways, I think that their their characters were a lot like each other. They're both uh, they are both intelligent, and they're both uh, they're both sociopaths as well. I've uh, got a couple of questions uh, from the uh, 
from the web chat. Uh, they all seem to be coming from the same person. Um, were there were there any uh, living members of the Gallo gang that you uh, spoke to, or are, you know, are they still in the family business? Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to answer that. That's uh, again some some professional distance there. Uh, so you you're not saying that you did or did not speak to them, or correct? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to skip some of these other things that he's asking here. I think you answered the basic part of that question. Um, did Nicky Barnes would he would he say that he and Gallo were similar in many ways, or, or were they very different? Well, I think that you know again, like I said, I think that they 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 shared similar interests and they both had their own visions of what they wanted to do with organized crime. Uh, you know, a guy like Nicky Barnes uh, wants to you know. Take, you know, take what he's he's learning, you know, the good things about what he's learning, you know, from being, uh, you know, with the black Muslims, and he wants to twist that to his own ends uh, in terms of building a, a black mafia to to rule the heroin trade. You know, I think Joey's taking a lot of uh, what he's, you know, learning in the coffee shops and, and again and, and reading in Camus and Sartre, and he's twisting it to his own ends uh, to achieve, you know, his, his own criminal uh, goals. So I, I, you know, I think that they're both. They're, they're definitely both parallel characters, and I think that uh, they definitely, I suppose, studying one illuminates uh, studying the other. Mm. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have this marked in, in, in my notes, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Was it was it Nikki that Joey took aside in Attica and explained how organized crime worked, how the setup was from the? the yeah, uh, Joey took Nikki aside, and he. Uh, this is in Greenhaven State Prison. Uh, you know, I think for a guy like Joe, you know, it's it's only to his benefit if a guy like Nicky Barnes knows how to build uh, build his own mafia, because you know that way you've got an organization and a structure uh, that you can use for the dealing of heroin. And so, you know, I think Joey was definitely using Nicky. Uh, you know, like listen, if I get this guy set up, then I can use him, and then we can we can go out and and, and conquer together. I'd say. Hmm. Uh, let's come back to uh, Joey's reading. W- was there anything in his uh, background and his upbringing? Uh, did, I mean, that would that would lead anyone to expect that this guy would be a reader that would be interested in this stuff? Was was uh, was Umberto his father? Was he was he a reader? Was he uh, interested in this stuff? No, well, I think you know, it's, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think like Joey, like a lot of people, he came to Greenwich Village in the early '60s. Uh, to kind of escape an upbringing, and his upbringing was very traditional. Uh, he was being groomed to uh, to be in the mafia, so I, I think Joey went to the village to, to seek something different. And there, I think he got swept swept up in this idea of you know reading as a way of, of liberation. Hmm. But it, it, in the end, it really didn't help him, did it? No, I mean it's uh, he he got gunned down. It's like I said on a. On the eve of his, or actually the day after his uh, his 43rd birthday, just hours after he was celebrating it, he was gunned down at Umberto's clan house. So, uh, no, that's 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 a bad ending for anyone, I'd say. And uh, Thomas, we kind of wind down. Uh, the caller before mentioned the Gaudis, and and the, the sense I think a lot of people have is that their influence has greatly waned um, with uh, uh, John's passing and his legal troubles and Junior's troubles. Uh, is there even a Gallo presence in uh, in New York City in, in organized crime these days, or is that just all in the past? That's all in the past. Yeah, and um, who is running things? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I certainly couldn't say. I mean, I, my my focus is is historical from the '60s and '70s. Okay. Well, and so you've uh, this is your your uh, second. Uh, crime-related book. Let me give out the title of the, the first one. Of course, that was the Nikki Barnes book, Mr. Untouchable, The Rise, Fall, and Resurrection of uh, Heroin's Teflon Don. Uh, and you wrote that with Nikki Barnes, so that had to be an interesting experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then this one, it, I don't think I ever gave the full title. It's called The Mad Ones, Crazy Joe Gallo and the Revolution at the Edge of the Underworld. Um, uh, what's next? What do, you, what, what do you follow this with? Well, this is yeah. There, there's certainly more stories to be, I think, mined from from that era of New York City. And I think that uh, crime stories are certainly an interesting way of of learning about the social and cultural history of, of a really exciting time in New York City. Okay, but I mean, do you 
so, I mean, do you have your uh, uh, sights set on another crime book at this point? Or well, well, we're, we're, we're working on it. I'd rather not talk about the next project at this point, but that's, it's certainly in that same sort of vein. All right. Well, uh, folks, you can uh, you can order you can find Tom Folsom's uh, colorful history of the Crooked Gallo Brothers, the Mad Ones, at great bookstores everywhere, or online at MrMedia.com or Amazon.com. And you can learn more about Tom's work at his website, www.TomFolsom. That's F-O-L-S-O-M. TomFolsomSolid.com. Um, Tom, it's a very interesting book, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob. All right, take care and good luck. And folks, for uh, more crime-related interviews, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversation with Donnie Brasco himself, Joe Pistone, and uh, as well as uh, O.J. Simpson's friend and publicist and documentarian, Norman Pardo, and uh, Craig Glazer, author of The King of Stings. Please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Pointer Online, MySpace, Facebook, NetVibes, Multiply, Zanga, Digital Journal, Friendster, Orkut, Bebo, Tagged, iGoogle, Yahoo, Podcast, Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, or Odeo. You can also listen with a piece of string in a tin can in many locations. Subscribe to Mr. Media in iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews within the podcast section of iTunes and click the free subscribe button. It's that easy. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. It's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give a piece of your day to spend it with us.